618 in Trinidad and Tobago. So rain in Debe, rain in Grandi as well, and rain in downtown Port of Spain. And, and we, uh, were, we were told uh, yesterday and indeed the day before that uh, we should see a change in the weather pattern from the uh, very, very stifling heat. Uh, that we've had over the past couple of weeks. So uh, it should be no surprise that we do have rain in many parts of the country. So just be mindful of that if you're on the move uh, this morning. One person who's on the move and, and moved in time to beat the rain uh, that's in downtown Port of Spain right now is uh, David Abdullah, the political leader of the Movement for Social Justice. And he joins us in the wake of all the different events that uh, were happening yesterday and other things going on in the politics of Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, David, good morning to you. Thanks very much uh, for joining us. Um, lots of things in the domain. We had uh, the Chief Justice uh, speaking out yesterday. It's been described as blows uh, by the Express and, I, and I, I reference the quote, I am too busy doing the people's work to keep replying to direct inquiries when they are based on false premises, so please don't waste any of our time. Uh, and we have a, a number of other issues related to governance on the table. Uh, what holds your, your, your interest uh, immediately? Yes, morning, Franz. Morning to, to all of your viewers and listeners. Um, I, I think that that statement by the CJ and one by the Prime Minister as well about his not, um, no problem about his being Minister of Housing um, at the time that the HEC contract was signed with the Chinese firm. Which has and that's the contract that was, was cancelled. That's yes. right. Yeah. That it's an indication that none of our leaders are taking responsibility for what is taking place in Trinidad and Tobago. So we had a poll which this, um, well, the OCM, yes. of which TV6 is a, a part, but published by the Express just two weeks ago. And the poll very clearly said that only 12% of the population had any confidence in the judiciary. Now, one would have thought, therefore, that the Chief Justice would have tried to address the issue of the loss of confidence of the population in the judiciary. There may be different reasons for it, but what is he doing as head of the judiciary to restore confidence? Because if people don't have confidence in the judiciary, which is, in a sense, to use a a baseball term, backstop. Yeah. Um, long time ago, we had long stop in cricket. Correct, yes. With somebody behind the yes. keeper. And now they have a, trying to do with the backstop in Brexit, which is another which well, is another yes, discussion. Which is another yes. kind of backstop. Yeah. Yes, but you know, you had long stop in case we could keep on somebody yeah, yeah. held down the leg side and we could keep on couldn't get the ball. But um, the judiciary really is the last place, the last port of refuge, if you wish, the last place you could go if you feel that the state is abusing um, your rights, if you feel your neighbor has infringed on your rights, whatever it is, then the judiciary is going to give fair and impartial justice. But if people have no confidence in that, to whom do they turn? You know, where, where is the, the, the institution or which is the institution that people have confidence that, that's in? That's why I wonder, David, you yeah. know, if we engage, uh, and, I, and I know that we talked about it before we came on here, there's such a level of polarization yes. that ultimately it comes down to which side you're on. So uh, people will say, well, why we listen to David Abdullah? He's an, uh, an, an irrelevance in the politics. He's a trade union leader. He's a left wing. He's a communist. He's a socialist and so on. So he has an agenda. But I, I don't know how many people actually are willing to listen to the merit of a particular discussion, whether you like or dislike an individual. For example, that's, that's why I reference what Rosemary Bell Antoine yes. had to say. There are many ordinary citizens out there who also have the right to be heard, the right to participate and obtain a remedy in our judicial system based on the merit of their cases, but they are prohibited from doing so simply because it's too expensive. Yes. Yet we continue this false narrative that we all have access to the courts. Right, yes. So, and, and there's, and, so there's no real equal opportunity in this country. So uh, how do we change that? We, we really have to change the system. In other words, but aren't you part of the system? You are playing the political game as well by trying to win an election. Yes. Aren't you playing the same game? Well, we are doing it, but not to win the election, to maintain the system. We really want to change that system. We want to change the status quo. You know, and you mentioned people will, will label me various things. And there was a famous archbishop out of, out of, um, out of Brazil who said, um, when posed with the question, he said, you know, when I feed the poor, because they're hungry, they call me a saint. But when I ask why they're poor, they call me a communist. Um, and, and so the labeling is very easy to put on people. But really, yes, we want to change the system because the system is not working. There's no accountability. There's no sense of responsibility. Our leaders are not held to account. Look, look what's going on in parliament. Um, on one hand, Dr. Rowley makes a statement. Leader of the opposition doesn't reply. Um, Dr. Munilal says, um, gives an apology in Parliament and to, to Mr. Hines and then when asked he said well you know I want to talk in the budget because the show is about to start. A show 
for them it's a show uh, but, but the buy, real but problems but of I, people I hear you yes. but the, uh, and the real problems are there the long lines to get service from the US Navy ship tells us about our health service That's right. and, and so on but but the point is listen to the listen to the national narrative it's about Indian African it's about UNC PNM uh, it, uh, and, and, and the issues about real governance are not really being discussed yes but a lot of people are saying they want change do they really want change the people are saying so people are increasingly saying so um, and people are coming forward you know to, to offer themselves for change I mean people are coming to the MSG in ways that they didn't come before um, I had a meeting with some people in Lavanti so good good morning to the to the people up at uh, St. Barb's uh, by Smiles and so on, and those persons who came to meet with me last week, Saturday evening. And people are saying they want change. Now, we didn't, we didn't, we not, we don't have money to, to buy votes like the other parties and so on. I met a gentleman yesterday um, at, at Techie when he says, well, you know, he, he was screened once by another party, but he wants to come over to MSJ. Um, a Indo Indian gentleman from from Gasparillo area. So things are changing. I think people do want change. The question is, of course, in their minds, how do we get that change? And increasingly, for me, and somebody you may say, you know, maybe that's, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm taking um, basket for people from people, but people are saying that they want change. Now, we have to therefore help people to make the step towards the change. And, and, how, and how do you do that? Because those in control, and, and, and we were, again, off air we were talking yes. about, the, the, we often talk about our polarization. Yes. It's probably worse in the USA. Yes. It's probably even worse right now in the great UK yes. with this whole Brexit thing. If you see how they, they're turning on one another yes. in the UK over Brexit, which is all about promoting race and all that kind of thing and fear of others and so on. But the thing is, how do you bring about change when those who control yeah. the, 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 the instruments that could create change, the media, big business who control uh, and so on, who, who want things to remain a certain way to allow things to continue, how do you bring about that change? It, it really has to come from below. And, and we've seen examples all over the world. The Me Too movement, the Black Lives Matter movement, um, students, young secondary students organizing protests around climate change, you know, organizing student strikes, staying home from school in, in many countries of the world simultaneously. So it is possible that people organizing a movement can in fact bring about change. That's how change has happened in this country before. Whether it was 1970, which changed the demographics of people working in banks and, and so on and gave people greater opportunities. Um, 1937, if you want. And there have been other key moments when people come together in movements to bring about change. And that is what has to happen. People have to coalesce and, and build solidarity um, around common interests. Um, and because the majority of people are the ones who are suffering from those who are controlling decision making in the country and yet there are so many other issues going on on in the in the public domain just that, that matter for example with the the, the cancelling of the contract yes the government would like us to believe that they, 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 they looked at it a second time and came to the realization that this was, was not properly done and so on. And we've heard from the HDC defending their position, which is clearly indefensible and so on. But this only came to light out of, out of a media investigation. It's only when these matters came to light that they are, they are now trying to create the narrative that they are doing the right thing for the country. Right. And so two things are, are wrong about what has happened. Um, well, one is that, that the agencies and people who, to make, who made that decision clearly made a very bad decision. You can't give a company um, virtually tax-free holidays by saying, not by government decision or policy, but by saying the HEC will then pay the taxes on behalf of somebody else. Now, that's wrong. Um, and, and then all the arrangements for labor and, and so on. So that was clearly wrong. The second thing that was wrong about it is that at the very start, those contracts should have been made public so that we would not then have to get freedom of information request to, to find out what is the nature of the contract and then force the government to change course. So if, there, if there's transparency and if the contracts are made public at the start, then people will know, hey, we can't go that way, you know, because that will become an embarrassment for us. But so the, we, but, we need to do it properly at the very beginning. But do, do we do that? Do we have a track, track record of transparency? No, we, we don't. We, this is my point. Yeah. The, the point is that the, the vast majority of us take it as a given 
that these contracts are negotiated and signed on be behind closed doors, one. And two, you had the HDC coming out and defending themselves, saying they did nothing illegal, which clearly misses the point. Yeah. Because we had in the previous administration, of which you were a part for a couple of years, whenever things were brought up, that whether it was the AG doing things that people question, is this the proper thing to do? So well, they haven't done anything illegal. Yeah. It, it's, it's almost as if the fact that you haven't done anything illegal it exonerates that, you, that exonerates you yes. from, from doing things that are clearly wrong. Yeah, and, and so all of that needs to be changed. Uh, all of that needs to be changed. And what is, you see, which is why the PNM and the UNC essentially are the same, because they both have operated in exactly the same way. And, and they skirt the line, the very thin line between illegality and, and wrongdoing, which is not illegal. You're absolutely right. Um, and that is why we need to to break that old politics, you know, we have to how, change that. How, David Abdullah? How? Because you, uh, again, yes. not wanting to sound insulting. Yes. You, you, again, will be seen as an irrelevance in the politics, that, that you have a, a long track record in the labor movement and so on. Uh, you, you, you started the MS, you were part of the MSJ, you were part of the People's Partnership, but you don't have enough of a political standing to count when it comes to elections. So, I, I, in essence, people will say, you could talk all, all you want, you're right. not going to do anything. And this local government elections may very well see a complete change in that because, because we, we are putting our candidates in, in many different corporations and people are gaining traction in those areas. So, Samuel Lavanty, we never contested Samuel Lavanty before, the regional corporation. Um, we were in Point Fortin and Arima, two boroughs before. This time we are contesting and we're going to run um, many, many candidates in the Samuel Regional Lavanty Regional Corporation. But where are you getting the money to run this? Because at the, at the, end, of the, at the end of the day, it's the big backers, the, the big financiers who have their own interests, who support the PNM, who support the UNC. There, there is that, that, that element of our business community, not all of them, but there is that element of our business community who always support PIP, the yes. party in power. Yes. But when it comes to election, just to hedge their bets, they give something as well for the other side in case they win, That's so right. that they will, the, the gravy train will continue. That's How right. do you break that? So we're not going to those who, who are behave like that. There are some business people, obviously, who will say, well, we like what you're doing, we like what you stand for, we will help you and we will support you. And so on, not with big money, but with small money. And, and you know, we're also going to have a whole effort to get small contributions from people um, on an ongoing basis, because if, if 2,000 people give us um, $10 a week, uh, you know, that's, that's $20,000 a week. And over a month, that's eighty thousand dollars, and that can do a lot in terms of the of the kind of campaign that we want, because our campaign is going to be very much on the ground, meeting people, talking with people, and 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 winning their trust and confidence, because that is trust and confidence is very important, which is why a lot of people don't vote at all, um, and so in this local government elections, for example. 70% of the population traditionally doesn't vote in a local government election. And if we could get many of those people to say, yes, we're going to go with the MSJ because we want change, that is what will make the difference. And they're not going to be swayed by millions of dollars of advertising. In fact, they're going to be turned off by millions of dollars of advertising. The only people who really benefit from all that advertising are the media houses. Of course, right? we, we, we all look, I mean, look forward secret, to it. we all look forward to election season. So this year and next year will be very good years for the media houses. But we, we are going to be on the ground and we've already started um, meetings, walkabouts in Point Fourteen, meeting in Buenos Aires, we had a meeting um, in, in St. Barb's the other evening and so on. So we have already started and, and people are responding to it because people are looking for change. But they want to feel confident that the MSJ is the vehicle for change. And they're saying to us that because we have stood up and defended people and we stand and we speak out for ordinary people because that's, that, that's, that's who count in this country, you know. But the elites don't treat the ordinary people as if they count, let, except as votes at election time. Let, let, we, could, we could develop that point a bit further and, and some other points that you, be, like, you'd like to focus on in, nation, in relation to the politics of Trinidad de Vigo. But let's take a quick break and continue our dialogue with the leader of the MSJ, David Abdullah, when we come back.
Drive and drive in good. The drive and drive in. The country moving smooth. The country moving. The dragon spitting fire, look how them five little children wrong. Explosion in Camp Omega, so the driver took the dragon down. But then 13 people dead in St. Dan's, up to now are still... 6.35 in Trinidad and It was not raining at the moment in Princess Town, but you can see that there has been some rain and it is overcast as it might be throughout much of Trinidad and Tobago right now. But let's return to, to studio to continue our dialogue for a few more minutes more with uh, David Abdullah. And in continuing with our, our, our procession of events that we, we talk about and are very much in the public domain, we have budget. We yes. have budget coming up October the 7th as announced uh, by the Finance Minister. Uh, what is your take on that? Well, it would take, of course, is that this is going to be an election budget. Um, the, the PNM is its last term, year of its term, and so it's going to be an election budget. They're going to try to um, run some, some things, some goodies, quote-unquote, to show the population that they really care when, in truth and in fact, those things are just short-term measures um, that are going to evaporate very, very quickly. So that's what I expect will happen. Um, rather than it being another attempt to transform the economy of Trinidad and Tobago, because there has been no transformation of this economy over the last four or five years. There's been no real diversification. Um, people are in extremely difficult circumstances. If you go down in the deep south and in south, um, the closure of Petrotrain has hit businesses very hard. Do you expect hit the Petrotrain? Sorry, yeah. Do yeah. you expect the Petrotrain issue to be mentioned at all in any me in any significant way? As far as a, uh, and of course, you're going to get a government narrative to at least explain and justify the closure of Petrotrain. Do you expect that in the budget? Yeah, they're going to they're going to pat themselves on the back, and it's going to be a false narrative. Um, because they're not going to tell us what is the real cost of, for, in terms of loss of foreign exchange, of importing gasoline, diesel, aviation fuel, compared to what we are earning in foreign exchange from the sale of, of crude oil. Um, because the importation of those products is costing us more in foreign exchange than, than the sale of crude oil. They're not, they're, so the, the, the false narrative will be trotted out again, as the government has done consistently from 2018 to now. Um, we're not going to get any sense of hope about how young people are going to get jobs in the country, whether they are university graduates or people coming out of school with passes or without passes. We're going to get nothing about how people who, the majority of the population has had no wage or salary increase for the last six, maybe nine years in some cases. And how are they making out with higher prices? The government will say, well, inflation is low. But yes, inflation may be officially low, but prices have been going up consistently for the last 10 years. So people are struggling to make ends meet. We're going to hear nothing about that. Um, we're going to hear nothing about the issue of crime and violence. A um, lot of talk by the Commissioner of Police and so on, but the number of murders at this point in time this year is higher than the number of murders a year ago. Um, so what's going to be done about crime and violence? None of those issues are going to be addressed fundamentally in the budget. And then we're going to get the usual accusations flying across the aisle in the parliament. PNM attack UNC, UNC attack PNM. They're going to try to go scandal, tit for tat in terms of scandals and allegations and so on. And while that is happening, poor people and working people are suffering. And in relation to that, if it is that, that just the, the, the finance minister catch our VAPs and decide to be, be straightforward with the people, wouldn't that be politically detrimental? Which, which politician would want to tell the country Times are hard, things are difficult, we are grappling with all sorts of different challenges, uh, we, we, we are finding things difficult to deal with. Th that would be considered politically responsible, not so? Yes, and because we have not leaders in this country, but managers. And there's a, a quote by a particular management guru which says that um, managers climb the ladder of success. Leaders work out if the ladder is leaning on the right wall. 
so that what we have are people who will say um, everything is good and so on, but they're not dealing with the fundamental problems of the country. So all around us, the country is, is crumbling, you know, judiciary in crisis. You mentioned the, the issue of the boat, the American naval ship that came down here and 5,000 people had to access health care because our health care system is not delivering public health care system is not delivering. You have a situation where um, we haven't heard what was the pass rate for the SCA and for the CSEC, how many of our children actually failed five subjects or, or didn't get five subjects in CSEC. I, I want to guess about 50% of them didn't. So we're not hearing about all those problems that are real problems in the country. Um, and, but is and there, is there yes. uh, again, apologies for, for interrupting you so often, but is there, a, you, you, you say that there's a movement on the ground very slowly, but is that enough to prompt those in authority into action? Because they, they, they can simply say, whether it's David Adula coming here to spin things in his favor, or whether it's Philip Alexander coming to insult the prime minister again, or, or shout down people and so on. These are just voices in the wilderness. We don't have to take them on because once we keep doling out the, the largesse, however little there may be, that's enough to... And we just have to focus on five marginals. Five marginal seats. We back in power and Abdullah and them will say whatever they want. Right. And that is going to change. That is going to change. What makes you so confident? What do I make so... Because, because people are seeing through... They see through it, you know. Don't feel that people don't know. Really, David? Yes, or are they, they just waiting for their piece of the action as they, well? They see through it. Yes, they want to get a piece of the action because they need it. They need to get um, money. They need to get a job because they have to survive. And so, yes, they will take, they will take the handouts. They will, they will do all of that because they have to survive. But they see through it. They know exactly what is going on. Talk to young people on the block young men who you might disregard and so on and think they're not paying attention to what's going on because they're dressed in a particular way. They know what is taking place. I was talking to some young but men. But are they ready to be a productive part of this society? If I could just yes. ask Susan that yes. question very quickly. Yes. Are they really interested yes. in being a productive part of our society or rather than living off the rest of us? Yes. So I was up in my tower two Fridays ago and talking to some young men and they said they're registered companies. These are young fellas on the block who have actually gone to the trouble of going to the com companies registrar and registering companies because they want to get involved in business. Talking to others, they have agricultural projects that they want to start up in Mike Tower, up in Hague Street, in, in, in Carinage, up in Scorpion. So yes, a lot of our young people want to do things. I walk around and, you know, like Emancipation Day, TIC, the Trade Investment um, Convention, Carifesta, and you see a lot of people doing things, entrepreneurship and so on. So yes, a lot of people want to be productive, want to make a contribution. They want to build a home, they want to build a, a, a future for themselves and their families. That's what people want. But the system is not allowing them, it's frustrating them to do that. And that is why we have to change that system. And that is why the MSJ is there, because the other parties don't want to change it. They're part of the problem because they're part of the system. And only the MSJ is really going to challenge that status quo in a fundamental way but, and change it. But in a, in, a, in a couple of minutes before we wrap up, David Abdullah, uh, is it real? How, so, so therefore, and, and, and you, you mentioned it uh, earlier on, that you expect to see in the local government election some sort of indication that there's really a, a, a serious movement on the ground to move away from this status quo. Yes. If that doesn't happen, what, is that, what does that mean for the MSG? We just have to do more work. It simply means that we have to do more education, reach out to people more, and, and, and win their trust and confidence so that they will um, support us going forward and be part of a movement. Because building a movement is not an overnight thing. It's something that you have to continuously work on. And, and, and in this country, a lot of people have become very cynical um, because politicians have betrayed them time and time and time again. I was asked on a radio program the other day about a particular individual and the person said, well, that person was a Judas. And I said, well, no, you know, the real Judas Iscariot are the leaders like Dr. Rowley who have turned their backs and betrayed even the founding principles of the PNM, which was for a more egalitarian society, a more equal society and so on, turned their backs on the people who have voted for them historically. But uh, just, just finally on that point, and that, isn't that what we tend to do very easily? Just put labels on people. This one is a Judas. This one is this. This one is a Nimakaram. This one is so and so. And that sells well with us in the media. Big headline, Judas, Iskandar, and, and so on. 
and it, it permits us to, to brand people in a certain way and not deal with the real issues that maybe that person would have brought up. Right. And, and so I, I generally shy away from labeling in that sense, but it was, in a con it was a context of somebody being labeled and I kind of yeah. turned, it, right. turned, turned it around. Um, and so I generally don't label and I try to deal with the issues. But we have to address the failure of leadership of and therefore the failure of the UNC and the PNM over the years. Because unless we face that, then we can't break free of their control and the people who are the puppet masters who control them, the elites in the society, who have kept people um, in the condition that they are. David that has to change. David Adula, thank you very much for joining us once again as we come around towards 6.45 in Trinidad and Tobago. Quite a bit of rain in downtown Port of Spain. And as you've seen from our images of TrafficTT.com uh, that there's quite a bit of rain elsewhere in Trinidad and maybe in Tobago as well. Looks dry at the moment in Princess Town, but let's uh, take a break. It is overcast, though. Be mindful of that. And we'll be back right after this break. Country move.